watching the clock here. Are we ready? Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Everybody awake back there? Well, first of all, I wanted to thank the Chamber and Carol and the team uh, for once again inviting Airports Council International back to this podium. Uh, I enjoy it every year, and I am a, a pro I am a prolific watcher of the clock here. Somebody just turned the clock off, so that means we can go on forever, right, Carol? Yeah, there we go. Um, so with me today, I have Jack Potter, who is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Metropolitan Washington Airports Authority, and Robin Rydell, who is the co-lead in the McKinsey Center for Future Mobility at McKinsey & Company. So I've been fascinating with the speakers this afternoon. So this is airports and sustainability environment. So I want to take us from where we were this afternoon, circling the moon, uh, having Artemis take off, hopefully by the end of the week, uh, going through the Van Allen belt, through um, geosynchronous orbit down to low Earth orbit, and landing safely back here in Washington to have a discussion on what I consider to be one of the main, biggest issues of affecting the aviation industry in this country, and that is sustainability and environment. Uh, it affects everyone. It's not just airports, it's not just airlines, it is everyone. And we all have a responsibility moving forward to reduce what all of us call the carbon footprint, to get down to a net zero by the year 2050. So, to begin the discussion here, I wanted to start off with my friend Jack Potter, uh, who's got long experience running airports, um, and I wanted to start with an on-the-ground experience, since we've been talking about upstairs, let's talk about what's going on at airports to be able to figure out um, where we're going on sustainability. So, Jack, because of the important role in communities, airports have very high standards. We are, as I like to call when I give speeches, airports are cities within cities. We have lots of the regulations and, and statutes that cities have to deal with, and folks like Jack and airport directors around the country are faced with having to deal uh, with how do, you, how do you sustain and make your neighborhood, whether it be uh, completely environmental or noise, um, to make them... Uh, you, continue to be good neighbors in the community. So, Jack, you have a big role here in the Washington area, and especially in an area as political as ours. Um, and with all the issues moving forward in terms of where we are um, as a country, um, in terms of sustainability, um, talk to us a little bit about how do you balance all that as an airport authority when you're looking at, you just built a brand new terminal in, uh, in Reagan, uh, American Airlines and you're, uh, announced a new terminal um, in Dulles and all the other projects that you're working on. So I'm going to turn it over to you and Jack. Well, you know, airports and the aviation industry in general is always pointed at uh, as being bad when it comes to the environment and having challenges when it comes to the environment. And I think it's incumbent upon everyone in the industry to do the best that they can to address environmental issues. And I know you're going to talk a lot about what's already been done from you know the, the aviation side, I'm going to talk about what does the airport do. So from an airport perspective, you know, think about the big things that you're trying to attack. One is you're trying to get people to move, uh, you know, from from cars to uh, you know transportation and, and use transit. And I think we've done a, a very good job in that regard. We're about to open up a station out at, at Dulles Airport. So both airports will be served by the Metro. Uh, we've embraced the notion of transportation network companies coming in uh, and providing service to folks. Uh, but more importantly, uh, when I came and started to prepare for this, I started to realize all the things that we've done. Now, my first, I'll be honest with you, I'm a cheapskate, so I always look to save money. So LED bulbs everywhere you can put them right, because we save money on those. Uh, we've moved and migrated as much as we can to upgrade our uh, fleet. So our, uh, our uh, police department, all hybrid vehicles. Uh, we have a, a, a major effort to reduce the waste that we dispose, you know, and, and so a big renew, renewable program. Everywhere you go, you're gonna see renewable uh, trash cans, uh, recycling, we have water stations for people, uh, we're building the biggest solar farm on an airport property in America. Uh, when it came to the compensation for that solar farm, what, we, what we're getting is an in-kind uh, uh, benefit 
in the fact that Dominion's going to provide charging stations for us. They're going to provide electric buses. Uh, we're going to build other solar uh, you know, uh, arrays on our campus. The bottom line is everything that we do going forward has a sustainability el element. And it's when you're building it and buying it, that's when you make that investment. So if you're going to buy a new fleet of buses, buy electric, see whether or not it's economic. And in our case, if you can get somebody else to pay for it, all the better, right? If you can get grants, go for it. They're out there, and so we're, we're taking full advantage of that, you know, as best we can. And so it's, it's really about everything. You talked about construction. You know, uh, I've learned more about rooftops and reflection on rooftops than I ever thought I'd know in my life. But the bottom line is we're building to lead. And so we have, you know, windows in our airports that, you, you know, you hit a button and it tints. It can, you know, it, 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 uh, it takes constant, uh, you know, uh, it, it's constantly evaluating the sun that might be coming through and it's adjusting the tint on the windows. So the bottom line is we've built into everything. Our codes, you know, construction codes, all have been modified uh, to, uh, you know, deal with environmental issues. So I have to tell you, in preparation for this, uh, I didn't realize exactly how much we've done. Uh, it's, it's really amazing because you build it into everybody's day-to-day -day job to say, okay, when I'm making a, a consideration for doing anything and I'm going to spend some money, how do I do it in a way that's environmentally friendly? So I'm very proud of the work we've done, but there's a lot more to, to take place. One of the things that I was, I was you know, telling my folks, we have to start thinking not just what we can do, uh, but what can people on our campus do? So we have a program now for green concessions where we're encouraging concessionaires, you know, to do environmentally friendly things and starting to give them recognition for it. But more importantly, we're starting to think about what's going to happen in the years to come. So when you're going to tell them about electric planes, I'm thinking, where are they going to get their juice from? Because Dominion, you know, power will bring, you know, ha have a power station, you know, right outside of our campus. But we're responsible for running that cable into whether it's an airline that wants it or rental car companies. So when you start to think about all of the changes that are going to occur, I, as the landlord of that airport, am thinking, how do I provide those services that will enable all the great things that we're going to talk about? So, Jack, you answered the second question I was going to ask you without me I even answering it. Pivot, yeah, Kevin. I'm you pivoting, know, baby. I'm pivoting, here. man. Um, one of the challenges I've had in all the years I've come before here, I talk about the, the needs to modernize America's airports, to make them 21st century airports. And, Jack, you just described uh, one airport's authority experience having to put this together um, to, to find the funding. Uh, we have been fortunate as an airport industry over the last two years during the pandemic, uh, two and a half years, uh, we have received about $45 billion between COVID relief and infrastructure money to get airports going. Um, this administration, the Biden administration, has, uh, through the airport terminals program, has granted, uh, I, I believe it's $5 billion a year in which airports have to compete for money. Now, we have a $115 billion need but nobody's going to turn money away, Jack, uh, for that. But you have to make certain that you're using this as a down payment and looking for other sources. But what we're talking about here is not cheap. It's not cheap, and it takes a coordinated effort of everybody, as you say, on the campus to be able to move forward. Um, I was in Orlando last week at the opening of their new Terminal C. And as Jack just described what they have to do at um, EMWA, Orlando built this $2.3 billion terminal and many of the same specs that Jack just described. And from the bottom up, five-year plan, all environmentally, between the glass, between uh, the circulation of the air, um, between all the environment, the use of water. It's in Florida, you watch the use of water. So this is the trend airports are going toward. But as part of the air, we're all part of the same system. And we have to work together with our airline partners, who uh, their big issue is um, safe aviation fuel, SAF. And, and frankly, that is, that is the future of aviation fuel. It's, not, it's here. It's going to cost a lot of money. It's going to require infrastructure, infrastructure change. So I'm going to pivot over to you, Robin, and let you speak for a little bit about what do you see as the future, um, not only of SAF, 
but all the other fuels that have been discussed that will reduce the carbon footprint at airports, um, even down to electric, electric jets, which I find amazing, which, by the way, electricity anywhere requires infrastructure, which has to go through an airport, and the question is, who's paying for it? Yeah. So, Robin? Well, there's, a, there's a lot to unpack there, and, and you know, kudos to, to the airports on what they're all doing, right, and what you're doing here in Washington and some of the others, because um, it is needed. At the same time, let's consider that if you really think about the environmental impact of, of air transportation, the vast majority of it comes down to the energy and the fuel we're burning, right? If you thought about, okay, everything that has to do with the airport, probably 95 plus percent is either airlines burning fuel or cars burning fuel getting to you, right? The same is true for the aerospace industry. Out of a typical life cycle uh, you know, emissions of a large narrow body, let's say, 98% or so is tailpipe emissions, right? Yes, we need to optimize how we build the, the, the aircraft and we have to you know, find ways to get um, you know, the materials in an environmental friendly way, but fundamentally the biggest challenge we're facing is the tailpipe emissions of our aircraft. And I think there's a whole range of solutions we'll have to apply because not one thing will fix it all. Sustainable aviation fuel is a, a really important one. Right? Fundamentally, sustainable aviation fuel means we are taking the carbon that we're going to emit while flying out of the air beforehand. We could do that through biofuels by planting plants and turn those into fuel. We can do that through synthetic fuels by capturing the carbon out of the air with direct air capture. Between you know, the technology we're going to use and the feedstock we're going to apply, we're talking about dozens and dozens different pathways to make sustainable aviation fuels. And which one will be successful, which one will be the lowest cost point, will differ by you know, where we are in time, but also by geography. Do you have a lot of solar, a lot of other green energy, you might go with synthetic fuels. You have a lot of land mass to plant, you might go with some biofuels. So there's a whole industry there uh, developing, and sustainable, uh, sustainable aviation fuels is really one of the big levers we need to use here, right? Because they can be used today in today's aircraft with, with some minor, minor changes, they can be used in today's airports ecosystem, and they're really what we call drop-in fuels. Now, in addition to sustainable aviation fuels, I think we need to work on a couple of other things. I think one is just operational efficiency, right? Um, delays on the ground and in the air where we burn fuel for, for no good reason because we're either not using airspace efficiently because we're not communicating efficiently between parties, um, you know, those kind of things we can actually fix. There's technology out there that we can work on, whether it's a, you know, artificial intelligence, better use of data, to kind of bring that down, right? So I think that's another important level we need to use, just operational efficiency across the board. And then, look, eventually novel propulsion, as I would call it, other energy carriers to, to fuel aircraft will become important. And, you know, that could be hydrogen, that could be electric. Um, it's probably going to be a mix of those. Hybrid is actually something that might come even earlier. And the reason I believe, and our research shows that we'll need to count on those to a degree, is that, you know, fundamentally, aviation has one big difference to most other industries, which is our climate impact in aviation is only about half from carbon emissions, right? Where for most other industries, carbon emissions are a really good proxy to the impact on, on the climate, but we have things like high altitude emissions. We're creating contrails, we're creating water vapor at altitude and NOx at altitude, and that has additional input. And so sustainable aviation fuels, as much as they will do to help us reduce the carbon emissions, will only do a small piece towards reducing all these other climate impacts. And so as we look towards 2050 and beyond, we'll have to think about what are some of these other technologies. And look, 2050 might seem very far away for us, but in the airline and aviation industry, that's actually pretty close. I'll give you the example. Every Boeing 737 that rolls out of the factory today is you know, calculated by the financiers to last 30 years. The airlines are counting on these to last till 2050. And so you know, we need to start early thinking about how long it will take to uh, you know, change fleets, build infrastructure at airports, et cetera. We need to start early thinking about some of that novel propulsion, even if it's not gonna be a massive contributor in the next 10 or 20 years. So what, what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing from you is by 2050, you believe that we're going to have a system in place where we're going to have a significant reduction of carbon emissions, which requires the airports, the aerospace, airframe manufacturers, the fuel manufacturers, every component of our system to work together toward a system where those are, are re and that's not just here in the United States, but all around the world. I mean, in, in our system, we have the airport carbon accreditation program uh, in, all five, in all five divisions of our, our system. And we have gone great lengths to reduce carbon emissions at our airports. Now, it's not where near where it, it can be, but I'm gonna go back to Jack for a second here. When you see this, Jack, and pretend you're working to your 100, 
which I know you don't want to do, but say you're 100 years old and still running MWA, okay? Um, what do you see, you know, in the next 30 to 40 years that MWA is going to have to do working with its partners to get to those numbers? I know you've started already, but what do you think you're going to have to do? Well, I, I, well first of all, we're going to have to deliver and, and provide support for whatever, you know, the aviation industry comes up with, what type of fuels there are. As you just said, it's, today we're talking about SAF drop-in fuels, so we don't have to change any systems, but going forward, I, I think we are going to have. There's one thing that you mentioned, Robin, that I think we started to talk about before, which is operational efficiency. And so one of the things that, you know, this metropolitan area in New York City, you know, the airspace is really a challenge. And how do we get, there's a lot of efficiencies today that we could be grabbing. Uh, every time, you know, there's, you hear about a, a rocket being launched, suddenly here's the airspace shut down. There's all this inefficiency that's, that's created. We have new, you know, uh, technologies come into bear, drones, you know, unmanned vehicles, et cetera, and so forth. So to me, when I look going forward, I scratch my head and say, how are we going to share this airspace efficiently, in addition to doing what we have to do from a fuel standpoint? But there are probably some things that you know today that we should be probably forging ahead and pushing on to, to really, uh, you know, create that efficiency today. Because I don't think it, we have to wait 50 years or, or 20 years that, no. for that to happen. Uh, but, you know, I think we need to, as an industry, and it's, we have the, the space folks in the room, uh, and we've been talking space, but therein lies the overlap. And whether it's, you know, all these new technologies coming to bear, I think we need to look at it from an operational standpoint and really figure that out. So that's a great segue, Jack, into what uh, is called the Mission Possible Partnership which is what you're working on, Rob. Why don't you uh, yeah, I enlighten think us? The, the Mission Possible Partnership, MPP, is uh, one of many, many efforts really out there to bring industry together and to solve this challenge ahead of us because it is a daunting challenge. We're going to need trillions of dollars of investment. We're going to need changes to systems. We're going to need new partnerships, new ecosystems. And so Mission Possible is looking at the hard to abate sectors, which aviation is one of, right? We're, we're constantly fighting gravity in aviation. We're having high reliability. We're an international um, industry where it's really hard to kind of maintain a level playing field. So all of those things make aviation really hard to abate. Um, and therefore, I think, you know, Mission Possible, but also, you know, what the World Economic Forum is doing, what AIA is doing, what you're doing at ACI, you know, all those efforts to really bring together the different stakeholders is really, really important. Because I think when we look at the future, we're going to have a very different industry. I mean, just to give you one example, when we really roll out SAF and, and biofuels, all of a sudden agriculture is going to be part of the aviation ecosystem, which it isn't today. Mm. So all of a sudden the farmers and you know, the industry behind that will be part of aviation. Right. How do we think about building those relationships? How do we think about the value chain that has to be created? Where does the value actually go at the value pools? There's a lot of work to be figured out. And it can't be figured out by any individual stakeholder. It needs to be figured out you know, by, by us as a community together, right? And so I think many of the people in the room here are involved in some of these efforts. And we, you know, that's great. And we need to do more of that. And those who haven't yet, look, look for opportunities to engage. Because I think no individual stakeholder, no individual company can really solve any of that without the, the broader collaboration. So you mentioned the agricultural community. That's a fuel issue, whether it be soybeans or corn, very similar to what we've done in the automotive industry to get emissions down. Um, then now we have the return of supersonic flight. Concorde's been gone for 20 years. I remember growing up on Long Island and watching the Concorde taking off from JFK, an amazing aircraft. And I hate this, you know, you see it now in the Air and Space Museum, but it was a beautiful aircraft. That's going to return. Well, that changed the equation a bit in terms of fuel, in terms of noise. And, um, tell me about the efficiency of the new supersonics compared to what it were 20 years ago. I mean, look, it's, it's, it's a fantastic time for an aerospace geek like myself. You know, we're looking at drones, we're looking at flying cars, we're looking at supersonic returning. It, it's an amazing time. But in a way, we got to have the license to do all those things and grow. And society, in the end of the day, you know, decides whether we have the license to do that. And I think being sustainable is going to give us a license to do that. And so that's why you see and you'll hear from you know, Blake Scholl at, at Boom Tomorrow and others. That's why a lot of these new companies are very focused on being sustainable from the beginning and sustainability being part of the design, right? It's just good business sense for them because it gives them the license to grow and do things, right? And I think the same is true for air taxis, the same is true for drones. Now, how are we going to get there and what are the technologies being used? You know, there's a lot of ideas out there. Um, none of them, I would argue, are fully proven yet or fully figured out. And I think it's up to this industry over the next 
couple of years to really prove those points and make sure that you know, we get this license to grow. Like on the supersonic side, I'm excited about the fact that you know, we might be able to bring supersonic back if we can do it sustainable through sustainable aviation fuels and really thoughtful system approach. Fantastic, right? Same with air taxis. If we can actually make eVTOL truly electric and you know, find green electricity to power them, fantastic. Now, all of that, of course, comes with the challenges you mentioned earlier. How do we get the infrastructure to charge? How do we you know, get the technology? What do we do with the batteries, et cetera? So it's a really complex problem in the end of the day. But what I find tremendously heartening and encouraging is that um, most of the players out there, if not all, are thinking sustainability from the beginning because they know they don't really have an alternative. Right. Well, sustainability really has to start at the very beginning of the planning process. As I've heard from our airports around the country that are going through rebuilding or new building, um, their planning process starts with sustainability because you can't begin a project and suddenly decide you want to be sustainable. It becomes very, very expensive. So I'm going to hop back to the airport side for a second, Jack. So picture Dulles Airport in 20 years from now. Okay. You have started, you're going to be starting a project in a year or so, uh, another terminal, which is great. It's great because Dulles is, uh, by the way, thank you all for being here. If you've flown, our employments are almost back to where we were in 2008. We're about 80% of where we were in 2019. Some airports are way above that, but we're back on the road again. We're getting about 2 million people go through our airports each day, which is great boon for the American economy. It is, I know it's been great with Dulles and also with Reagan. But So 20 years from now, Jack. Um, what do you see if you came back and looked at Dulles? What do you think the most significant sustainable or environmental changes you'll see at the airport? I think you're going to see, uh, first of all, everything will be kind of electrified or have some other source of fuel. I think that's going to be one of the big things you'll see. Uh, I think uh, we're going to try and move people other than on those mobile lounges out at Dulles Airport <laughs> yeah. and get them you know, moving. Uh, on other conveyances. Uh, I do think you're going to see a mix of, of aircraft like you've never seen before, and I think Robin talked about that. Uh, I also think that, you know, with the introduction of some of these, these new technologies, uh, I think short-haul transportation is, is likely to, to change in direction and will we're perfectly position at Dulles for, for long-haul and international travel. I do think that uh, you know we are uh, we will be challenged uh, to uh, meet the needs of, of the public going forward. Uh, we're fortunate at Dulles that it was uh, one of the more recent air, air, airports to be built, even though it's 60 years ago, right. uh, and it was in a green field. So uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done with the community from a noise perspective. Uh, to be quite honest with you, the supersonic scares me uh, because we did have the Concord at Dulles and it was a major source of a challenge. So you, know, you, you mentioned, Robin, how important the community is and community acceptance is. Uh, so that will be the challenge going forward to maintain you know, an area around Dulles that respects the, the noise contours, uh, that adapts to changes that occur in the industry. Uh, and uh, I think we're gonna have to be careful and guarded about you know, what the traveling you know, uh, patterns are going forward in terms of use of uh, aircraft versus other, you know, means, whether it's high-speed rail or other uh, opportunities that folks have or other forms of, of, of uh, again, aircraft. It might not be at a major airport. It no. might be, you know, domicile somewhere closer to downtown, uh, you know, and, and rural areas. So uh, I would say that our job as the catcher of a lot of this is to react to what happens within the industry, respond as quickly as we can, work with the community to try and figure out what's happening long term, and try and be part of the many solutions that are being put in place that Robin talked about, but be part of them early on so that we don't become the inhibitor of the ability to, to make progress. So I'm going to ask you both this question. Do you think thus far with the changes that the aerospace and airport and airline industry are doing uh, to become more sustainable. Um, have we done a good enough job in promoting what we're doing thus far to the public so the public has confidence that where we are today is not where we're going to be in five or ten years? Can we do it better? And, and that's not just on airports or airlines. I'm talking about the entire supply chain contributing to that solution. So, Robin? Yeah, look, I think this is, this is something I think about a lot, which is this industry, because fuel costs money and therefore we had an inherent reason to, to reduce fuel burn, 
has been making tremendous progress over the last, you know, basically since ever, right? right. Since the beginning of the industry. Over the last 20 years, we're about 3.5% down in terms of fuel consumption per passenger every single year. Right? Every new aircraft that comes out is 20% more fuel efficiency. There are some massive wins in this industry, right? And this industry has always been focused on optimization. And I don't think we're talking about that enough. We're getting a little bit of the, hey, aviation is a dirty industry, especially in Europe, when really aviation has fundamentally, from the beginning, been focused on improving and improving all the time. And, you know, I see a world where, you know, if we're not careful about the story and the narrative we tell and that moves forward, we might get aviation curbed. You know, you already see legislation in parts of Europe coming up where people are saying, look, aviation shouldn't grow anymore. We shouldn't be able to fly domestically in certain right. countries. And to me, that would be a major loss because aviation is so much positive on, you know, humankind. The ability to connect with different countries, with different continents, contributes to world peace. And I'm, I'm you know, truly believe that, right? So to me, it's up to all of us to find a way, A, to tell our story, and B, to continue push harder to really, um, you know, not risk that aviation might at some point be curved and all the benefits received from it being curved with it. Jack? You know, I'll just jump on that comment. Uh, you know, first of all, I think you always can do a better job communicating and sharing what's going on. Uh, in terms of the airports, you know, I think that a lot of great work is being done. More can be done. More will be done. But the bigger picture for the, for the industry is what you just talked about. It's the footprint of what happens with an airplane. Uh, I do think that, you know, the discussion that has occurred now where there's a lot of, you know, talking about alternative fuels and you see all the airlines are all buying huge quantities of SAF, and, which is great. Uh, and I really like the message that you sent, which is there's a balance. You know, there's a transition. I think we need to talk about the transition that's going on. So it's not, hey, we're the bad guy now. It's we've made progress. We have a game plan that will continue to make progress, but we're not going to lose the contribution that aviation plays in terms of the economies of the world and, as you just said, peace. I hadn't thought about that aspect, but huge economic contributor to every community that they're in. And, uh, and so I think it's got to be a balanced message. Where we are today, we've made progress. Going forward, we have a plan, but the key here is to preserve this industry because of the, all it does for society and all it does for the economies of the world. Well, just think what, about what our economy would be without aviation. I mean, think about what that does, not only domestically, but internationally. If you shut that down, if you did, you know, you have flight shaming in Europe. When I heard that term, flight shaming, a couple of years ago, I said, oh my gosh, how are we going to get beyond that? Uh, sustainability and environmental uh, awareness will help change that. But I do think it's going to have a concerted effort of talking to the public about how we're doing it and what they're experiencing. Robin, you're gonna... Yeah, I, I wanted to make one maybe, maybe appeal to, to the group here as, as leaders in this industry. We, we talk about this a little bit like, oh, there's something big negative happening and here's how we mitigate it, right? And I think there's also a narrative here of this is actually a massive business opportunity and innovation opportunity, right? The, the change from fossil fuels um, across the industries is probably the biggest reallocation of capital we've ever seen in the, in the history of mankind, right? We will have... To, to the point of agriculture joining the aviation ecosystem. We're gonna have business opportunities, opportunities for innovation, changes in value chains over the next 10, 15 years as we're kind of going along this journey that will provide tremendous opportunity for all of you in the room, your companies, to do things differently and you know, create new opportunities. So I would also just balance the message around, yes, it's a daunting target we have, and yes, it comes with a lot of investment need and cost, but it also creates a tremendous amount of opportunities for businesses. So I have a minute left, and Carol, I am doing really good on time here. So I'm going to put a plug in. The president was in Boston yesterday, and he mentioned the fact that of the top 25 airports in the world, there were no U.S. airports listed as the top 25, which is stunning. Um, it doesn't mean that we don't have great airports. Don't get me wrong, but I don't know who's doing the rating here. It's not me. I can tell you that. But um, it falls in line with the fact that as we move forward as the aviation industry um, uh, and the aerospace industry, our goal is to make where people take off from and land welcoming. They're, they are a reflection of where you're going. Uh, they're a reflection of the local communities. So and when you fly into an airport, whether it be at Dulles or Reagan or Indianapolis or San Diego, it's a reflection of that economy.
And the more we can put back in the aviation, more attractive uh, those airports become, the more commerce we'll get at those airports. So with that, anything else, gentlemen, before we close up here? Thank you all. Carol, we're thank 20 you seconds. Yeah. You've got 20 <laughs> seconds back in your book. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.